Hello everyone, thank you all for joining me today. I'm Judy Piper, I'm, I'm an engineering lead at C-Labs and also the host for this Cello Tech Talk series. Cello Tech Talk is one of many Cello Foundation's efforts to share and spread Cello technology knowledge with the growing Cello community. Back in April, we started the Cello Tech Talk series um, online with a Cello introduction talk to give a high level overview of Cello architecture, full stack architecture and design. Um, yours truly did that tech talk, first tech talk. Um, from that, we delved deeper into different building blocks of a Cello full stack solution during subsequent sessions. We also went deep dive into Cello's consensus mechanism, proof of stake, uh, and talked about stability protocol, um, how it works to bring a new um, financial system to be st stable. And we also talked about how Cello platform is governed in a decentralized way. And we also covered price oracle, phone number privacy, SDK, and seller blockchain deep dive, and building your first um, blockchain decentralized applications on seller platform. Seller's mission is to build a financial system that creates conditions of prosperity for everyone. Based on our usual research, we realized early on that we needed to build a full mobile first, full stack solution. We gave us a technical deep dive on Valora, uh, which is our Cellos uh, mobile wallet that highlights the vision of building a truly accessible financial system. Last week, Bob Dan, uh, who is a protocol engineer at C-Lab, gave a detailed overview of a Phyllis onboarding feature we added to Valora and why this feature matters for the financial inclusion. And by the way, all these uh, cello tech talks that I mentioned um, is available on YouTube channel and we have a cello tech talk um, playlist. So please do check them out um, if you miss them. And this week we have Kobe joining us. Uh, he is a crypto team's uh, lead, technical engineering lead at CLS and to talk about uh, Plumo and the upcoming Plumo ceremony. Kobe, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Before we start the talk, um, can you share um, how you got to work on Cello and how you joined uh, CLAB? Yeah, for sure. So I joined CLAB and started working on Cello about a year and a half ago. I think it's, it's actually a bit more right now. Um, and the way I joined is I've been working for the last few years on zero knowledge proofs and for more than that on cryptography in general. And um, this is a topic that uh, I, I really like. So I've been involved in both ZKPEs and blockchain for some years now. And actually in a conference for standardizing zero knowledge proofs, which is called ZK proofs. I met uh, Merrick, which is the city of c -Labs. And they told me about the really interesting and uh, important mission that Celo has. Um, and also the many interesting challenges that can be solved using cryptography. And uh, yeah, since then I'm here having fun and hopefully solving good problems. Awesome. Do you want to then, let's get started. All right. Yeah, let's get to it. Thanks for the introduction, Judy. So we are talk, going to talk about Plumo uh, today. And specifically um, to those that don't know Plumo yet, Plomo is the name that we give to our uh, very optimized light client that we have in Celo. Uh, which is using SNARKs in order to create a very ultra light client. And more concretely, we are going to focus today on what it means to do a setup for Plumo. And a setup is needed because it is a SNARK, and a SNARK, because it is a SNARK, some of you may have heard that some SNARKs need to to go under through a setup or a ceremony of that sort. 
And for that, we built a Sparrow, which is our setup system that we will be using for Plomo. So before we talk about the setup itself, let's talk about Plomo. Let's recap a bit. So let's start with what it means to build a proof of stake light client in general. And as you may remember from Bitcoin or Ethereum, which are proof of work networks, in order to build a light client, what you have to do is you have to download all the headers of all the blocks and verify that the proof of work happened there correctly. And after you synchronize your state to the latest state, then you can start making light client queries. And what I mean by that is you can check, for example, on Ethereum, your balance or the contents of the storage in a, in a contract, for example. So this is what you do. You download all the blocks, you verify the proof of work, and then you can do like these lifeline queries. So that's for proof of work. And in proof of stake, it's similar. Um, and we're talking about validator-based proof of stake networks, like several. And in those networks, you don't verify proof of work, you instead verify signatures. So let's say that Celo has 100 validators right now that participate in producing blocks. And in order for a block to be deemed valid, then you have to have 67 signatures out of the 100 for it to be deemed valid. So a very direct light client would have been just download all the blocks and verify this, that you have at least 67 signature for each block. And once you sync to the latest block, then you can make light client queries. But that becomes really heavy, really fast for two reasons. First, it's data intensive in the sense that improved state networks that are really fast, so like Celo that has five second block times, then you are going to get to 17,000 blocks per day, which is a lot to download. And the second thing is that also verifying the signatures, while not super heavy, it's still not the best thing to do when you are on a mobile phone, especially like or other resource constrained devices. So that's what we discussed. So we have three techniques that we use in Celo in order to make this faster. And one is something we call epoch-based syncing, which is optimizing the amount of blocks that you have to download and verify signatures on. And let's see how that works. So we've described that we have a set of 100 validators, let's say in the Genesis block, but the set of validators changes over time. And the changes because there are different stakes that validators put in, different reputation, the community decides to vote for other validators, and some validators get slashed. And all of these things can cause the validator set to change. And in Celo, it's been decided that we, we like the system, performs elections of new validators and just changes to the validator set every day. So every 17,280 blocks, essentially. Now, this already gives us a very nice savings factor because now we don't have to download all the blocks within a day. And why is that? So let's say that we have the Genesis block with the 100 validators here and the validator set changes here. Um, and let's say that we want to make a light point query towards this block, this block in the middle. Now, do I have to download all the blocks before that? So in proof of work, I have to, because these things are built on top of each other. But here, I don't have to, because the validator set did not change in this duration. So all I have to do is verify the signatures from the validator set that I know from here on this block. And that with 
good certainty will allow me to understand that this block is valid and because it's signed by the correct validators and I know that there hasn't been a change. So that's already a very nice savings factor. The next thing is that we use BLS signature aggregation. And what I mean by that is that if we're talking about normal or let's say more popular signature schemes such as ECDSA, such as the one that's used in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and also in Celo, actually, for transactions. So if we're talking about the CDSA signatures, then let's say that I have a list of 67 signatures. Then now I have to verify 67 signatures. On, and that's already annoying for, again, two reasons, a lot of signatures, a lot of data, and I have to verify all the signatures. So that's already annoying. but. For consensus, we use install the BLS signature scheme, which allows you to aggregate the signatures into a single signature. So instead of having 67 signatures, we only have a single small signature that you can verify pretty fast. So that's another nice savings factor. And the last thing, which is actually what Plumo is, is we can use SNARKs in order to reduce this even further. And by using SNARKs, I mean that now think about verifying multiple epochs. So we've already seen that within an epoch, within a day, we don't have to verify the blocks in between. But we already have to, we, we still have to download all the blocks where elections happen. So I still have to download a block each day and verify the elections and verify signatures and so on. So can we do better? And the answer is yes. Let's say that we want to synchronize half a year, which is about 180 blocks. So in order to do that, and to those of you that already know what SNARKs are about, what we can do is we can write a SNARK program that runs the Slack line protocol of download an epoch, verify the signatures, update the validator set, and do that again, and do that again, do that again, from day one to day 180, such that we have as an input the Genesis validator set, and as an output the validator set at day 180, and without seeing any, anything in between, just a small cryptographic proof that the light client protocol ran correctly, that's what we get from this smart program we just get a small start proof, two validator sets, and that's it, nothing in between. And that's exactly what Plumo is, is this snark that allows us to compress many, many days of synchronization into a small start proof. And let's go really quickly about what it means. Um, it basically means what I described before. We need to take all the all the public keys of all the validators. We need to see that more than two thirds, so let's say 67 sign, and we need to check the bill of signatures and so on. So that's exactly what the SNARK proof that Plumo does. And in order to facilitate that, we had to use uh, quite special curves, but I will not go into these cryptographic details in this talk. And there are other talks that you can watch that would explain all this. Um, because what we want to focus on today is the setup. So what I want you to take out of this is that we have an elliptic curve that's called BW6, which is a pretty big elliptic curve, more than the one that we're used to. It's like 760 bits. And the SNARK proof is working on that curve. Just want you to remember these facts. So now before we go further into what is the setup, let's talk about what are SNARKs. 
So there is a nice example that uh, is usually given when talking about zero knowledge proofs that I want to to get to. And snarks can be perceived as a way to do computational integrity proofs and also zero knowledge proofs. So it's good to have this background. So let's go over this example really quickly. So we have a situation where we have a cave and we have two people. And in this cave, uh, we have a door, a secret, a door with a secret password that can only open once you enter the secret password. Now, Peggy claims, this is Peggy, and she claims that she knows the password to the secret door. And Victor, unfortunately, doesn't believe her and asks her to prove it to him. So they decide on the following experiment. This cave has two ways to go into. This is the entrance, and these are the two ways, left and right. So they decide on the following experiment. So Victor will stand with his back to the entrance of the cave while Peggy goes in. And Peggy will choose a direction, but for she will choose it by herself. So let's say that she chooses to go left in this direction. Now, after she arrived at the door, Victor will now shout which direction he wants Peggy to come back from. All right, so let's pay, say that Peggy went left and Victor shouts, Peggy, please come back from the left side. Okay, so if it doesn't matter if Peggy knows the secret password or not, she can just come back from the left side because she's here. All right, but if she, if Victor tells her to come back from the right side from here, and she went to the left side, then Peggy can only come back from the right side if she knows the secret word, because otherwise she will not be able to open the door and come back from here. So, as you can see, this experiment has a probability half to be successful, even if Peggy doesn't know the secret password. So with probability half, Victor will be certain that uh, Peggy knows the secret password. That will happen when their decision mismatch. So in order to improve the confidence, like. 50% confidence is not very high. So to improve the confidence, what we can do is repeat the experiment many, many times uh, until we get to a confidence level that we are good with. And this works because these are going to be experiments that are not related to each other. And as we know from uh, probability theory, the total probability is going to be the product of all these experiments. So it's going to be one over two to the number of experiments. So you can get to a really good, so the, the probability of cheating, and uh, that will be the probability of cheating. So with not a huge amount of experiments, you can get to a really good confidence level. All right. So that's an example of a zero knowledge proof. And this is zero knowledge in the sense that Peggy did not reveal the secret word to Victor because she doesn't want to, but Victor still knows now that she knows the secret word, and that's all they wanted to establish. Okay, so those are like general zero knowledge proofs, but what are snarks? So let's again give an example. So we have here a function, a polynomial. And I want to prove that I know a solution to this polynomial. And this polynomial has 10 solutions, uh, the most, uh, because it's a degree 10 polynomial. So I can do it in a few ways. I can, for example, send directly the single solution that I want to show that I know. That works. Um, all right. But this is already not ideal, maybe, because in order to verify the solution, the verifier takes the solution that I sent and now 
plugs it in into this function. And now they have to raise it to degree 10, multiply by 500. That are, starts to become heavy, especially if the function is very complex. This is not very complex function, but I hope you get the idea. And furthermore, what if I want to show that I know all the solution, all the 10 solutions that this function has? Now I have to send 10 solutions, and the verifier has to verify all the 10 solutions. That becomes both data intensive, I have to send like a lot of data, and also becomes computationally intensive because I have to raise it to degree 10, multiply by 500. Not for one solution, I have to do it for 10. So with smart proofs, we can take problems of this sort and present a problem of the sort of, please show me that you know all the solutions to this function and send me a small proof that proves it to me. And that's the magic that you can get from here, is that you don't have to verify to verify by performing a lot of work. You just verify a single proof for all the solutions. And this becomes even more significant when these functions are much more complex. Let's imagine like very, very high degree polynomials or things of that sort or any other complex problem you can think of. And if we break down what the SNARK acronym means, so it means it's succinct. This is the S. And succinct means that you don't have to send big solutions, like the 10 solutions that we've talked about in the slide before. You just have to send a small cryptographic proof. Non-interactive means that in contrast to the situation where with Peggy and Victor, Peggy went to the cave, Victor shouted uh, direction, and that was an interactive process. With snarks, this can happen non-interactively. I can sit on in my home and generate the proof without any input from the verifier, which is very nice uh, for some use cases. And uh, arguments, uh, it's a synonym for proofs, in some sense. And of knowledge means that I not only prove that there is a solution, because sometimes it's useful that just to know that there is a solution, but I also prove that I know the solution. Like in the example of with Victor and Peggy, the, the doer has a secret password. Like, it exists. But Peggy wants to show that she knows the secret password. And uh, you may have heard from other places about ZK snarks, uh, which is an extra step, which also means zero knowledge. So if we take the polynomial example, maybe I, I not only want to show you that I know the solutions, I also don't want you to learn the solutions. I just want you to show you that I know them. Um, so zero knowledge means that you do not, as the verifier, learn anything about the solution. Okay, now I'm not going to go over all of this slide, don't worry. But what I want to give you is a taste of why we need to do a setup for SNARKs. Because I've described something that is really nice, like, okay, cool, we have an algorithm that, or we have a proving system that allows us to create cryptographic proofs without interaction, they're succinct, but how how this sounds like too good to be true <laughs> and it's in some sense you have some trade-offs and the trade-off is that for some snarks and the proving system that we're using is called growth 16 and this proving system has to go under a setup in order to to be used by provers and verifiers and I want to give you a taste of what it means to go through the setup. And in very, very high level, in order to create a growth 16 snark, you have to represent your problem as a set of polynomials. And 
this is a non-trivial process and there's the post uh, that I linked in the bottom here will describe how it works in more detail. And please accept it as a black box now. So you present the problem as a set of polynomials. And the idea is, is that if you know a solution to the problem, if I as the prover know the solution to the problem, I will be able to produce a special polynomial or a polynomial that fits some form. And if I'm able to produce this polynomial, then the verifier can be very confident that I actually knew a solution to the problem. All right, so let's say that I actually produced this polynomial. Now, how do I convince the verifier that I actually produced the correct polynomial? And for that, let's look at some small drawing. So if we want to verify the two polynomials are equal, I can do it in many different ways. So there is one direct way where I can do it by sending the polynomial, but that would be a problem for both efficient reasons and both zero knowledge reasons where it applies. So let's say that I have this polynomial and let's say that I have like another polynomial, which is the same. So what we can see here is that if these two polynomials are equal, then they will be equal at every point. So it doesn't matter where I check. They will be equal here, they will be equal here, they will be equal here. It doesn't matter where I check in which x coordinate. All right, but what happens if I have two different polynomials? Something of that sort. Then they will be, they will not be equal at all the different points. They will be equal here and here and here and here and maybe some other places, but in most of the places they're going to be distinct. So if I check them here, if I check them here, we're going to get two different values. So as a consequence of, of that, what we have, which is a fundamental thing in algebra, is that if we have two different polynomials, they're only going to be equal in, the, in a finite amount of points. So if we choose randomly, different points, or so, sorry, if I choose randomly a single point, so I choose randomly this point, then most likely they will not be equal. So the idea is that we're going to, in order to check that two polynomials are efficiently equal to each other, by checking them at a single random point. And if they are equal at this random point, then with a very, very high probability, they're going to be equal everywhere. That's the idea. Now, the problem is that, okay, sure. So, all right, you told us you have a snark, Roth 16, you have to choose a random point, that's nice. But why do we have to do a setup? Why do we have to do a ceremony? Why is this thing so complex? Why is it just not like, toss a coin and choose a random point. And the reason is that if a prover knows the random point, a malicious prover, then they can create fake proofs and fool the verifier. And that's the problem. And the reason we have to make a setup is that we have to jointly generate the random point in a way that no single person knows it, knows the entire point. And that's that's more or less a very major reason why we need to do a setup. So the cryptographers in the crowd might notice that 
there are more things that you have to generate in the setup, but that's one of the major things that we have to do. Without it, um, we are lost. We have to generate the random points in a multi-party manner. Okay, so now that we know that we have to generate these points in together, let's do it. Uh, so how do we do it? So let's talk about setups, snark setups that have happened in the past. An example that I like is the Zikish setup. That's, uh, I think, the first setup that actually went to production that happened already a few years ago for the first version. And there was another setup for the second version. And um, for the first setup, a few people participated. And uh, you know what? Let's talk about the second setup. For the second setup, tens of people participated. And this setup had two rounds and about between 70 and 100 people participated in each round. And it's enough that at least one person was honest and deleted the randomness and their share of the random point for it to be secure. And with high probability that happened because 70 people participated and some of them are widely, widely known. So their reputation kind of guarantees that they deleted the randomness. And in Zcash, uh, you can think about what was the snark. The snark was about private transactions. So I want to, in Zcash, when I want to transfer uh, Zek, the Zcash currency, what I want to show is I want to show that I own some Zek. And I want to show that I spent it correctly in some sense, that I didn't create any new coins. I didn't destroy any new coins. I just transferred them. And this is the snark proof that happens there. And that's, that's an example of a setup that happened a few years ago. And you can see that uh, some people got creative as to how to get their randomness that they are going to contribute to the setup. And so here we can see a Geiger counter. So someone went ahead and flew over Chernobyl and took measurements of, um, of radioactive material and uh, they used that to, to to generate randomness to contribute to the Zcash setup. And here, I think we can see an example of the first setup where afterwards the computer was destroyed so that nobody can actually get to this random number later on and so on. So you can ask yourself, why are we still doing setups? Because some of you may have heard about Starks or Plonks or Marlin and all of these new proving systems that are different than Roth 16, which is what Zcash used and what, uh, what Pluma uses. And you can ask yourself, like, why are we still doing setups? And there are a few reasons. One reason is that the snarks that we are using, like the Roth 16 snarks, are very good in proving time. They're very, very good in verification time. They're still most, almost the fastest to verify. And they produce the smallest proofs amongst all the different other systems that exist. Um, but there is a difference between the setups that we're doing today and setups that we've been doing in the past. So if we talk about the Zcash example, so the program size, which is measured in something called amount of constraints, the program size was about 2 million constraints, which is not small, but not huge. And if you compare that to Plumo, so Plumo has hundreds of millions of constraints. So it's much, much larger and much harder to produce. So if a setup for Zcash took an hour for someone to run, the Plumo setup takes much more time. So that's something that's different about setups today. And there are other systems that are in the same problem or the same situation. So rollups are in the same situation where they have big setups and so on. 
And this is where Sparrow comes in. And Sparrow is a system that allows us to do setups for snarks that are very big. And it's optimized in a way that you can work in parallel. So instead of people having to contribute one by one to the ceremony, then we can contribute instead of sequentially, we can contribute in parallel. And to give a taste what that means, in the Ziggish ceremony coordination, where people contribute to the ceremony happened by email or like a mailing list, and it was sequential. So if I wanted to contribute, I had to talk with someone that ran the coordinator, like an untrusted coordinator that had to run some software, and I had to schedule some time. And when my turn arrived, I had to download some file and then run some computation and then upload a new file after my processing that includes my randomness. And this sequential process was slow because it was manual coordination and, and it was annoying to run. So you can imagine that a Zikash ceremony that had 70 participants, even though that each participation took about an hour or a bit more, but not more than that, it still took about three months to get to 70 participants, which is not ideal. So a Sparrow is both automatic, you don't have to do manual coordination, and it also, it's also optimized for large circuits. Um, in the way that it runs in parallel, so you don't have to work only sequentially like I described in the email example. And also it's just optimized in the sense that it knows not to consume all of your RAM. So even though you need to download in some sense 70 gigabyte file, you don't have to hold it in RAM. So it can work on normal laptops or normal desktops. So it's pretty good in that sense. So uh, this is a, um, a comic that I like from XKCD. So like we have many different systems and uh, why do we need another system? So I hope I gave you some idea of why. Um, and um, the Plumus ceremony, which is going to set up the Plumus program or the Plumus Lite client is starting right now. It's starting very, very soon. Um, we're actually already testing it, or more correctly, we're already running the first few phases uh, internally, first few rounds, more correctly. And uh, then we're going to invite others. And I welcome you to read more about it. There is a Medium blog post, and that explains a bit about what is the Plumo ceremony, which is kind of what I covered here today, but maybe in more details. And I also invite you to sign up to the ceremony. And if you have a computer uh, that you can leave on for, let's say, between 12 and 36 hours, and you have a good internet connection, and uh, you can publicly attest that you are someone that uh, participated in the setup and that you deleted your randomness, then it would be really awesome if you could join and participate in, participate in the setup. And there is a sign-up form, uh, which I know that you cannot copy from here. Uh, you can access it from the Medium post, but we will also publish the links later. Um, and uh, yeah, so for people that want to participate in the setup itself, now we are going to have a live demo that shows how to actually participate in the setup once you, you get invited. So Judy, I would love your help in doing the live demo. So just to give a background on what it means to participate. So when you participate in the setup, you are going to go through two steps. 
both of them are quite easy, but these are two steps. So if you see in the cell documentation, the first thing you have to do is you have to generate your randomness and your address. You are also going to be associating a cell address with your participation. So there are two steps, generating your address. And after you get added by the coordinator, which is going to be C-Labs, then you can also run the contribution software. OK, so Judy, I'm going to yep, I'm disable ready. my sharing. Yeah. Oh, you already took over. Cool. So first thing I'm going to do, I already downloaded the software. So I'm going to just run the generate. And it's asking me to enter some identifying information, such as your Twitter. So I say, add hello, Chugi. And entropy, this is something I should remember, right? So no, the... So I enter and I forget. Yeah, exactly. This is your randomness. This is what you also need to delete later in some sense. So this is just, you can mesh your keyboard, you can do whatever you want. You can take a phrase for, that you randomly heard in the street. Whatever is most random that you can put in, and you don't need to remember that. I did. Cool. Okay. And now this is one that you do need to remember. Mm -hmm. This is going to encrypt your randomness. All right, so before we continue, um, I just want to recap why we need this identifying information. So remember that uh, we said that we need one honest participant in the ceremony in order for the whole thing to be secure. So in order to establish the honesty, uh, what, we're, what we are doing is that we are associating every contribution with a cell address. And if you include the cell address in a tweet, um, so for example, afterwards, you're going to be having a file that's called like plomo.attestation that contains a, a ready-made tweet that you can just tweet later on. And if you publish that, somewhere public like Twitter or GitHub or any, anything else, then that establishes the link between the cell address and the identity, your real world identity. And if enough reputable people participate in the ceremony, that we can be certain or with high probability be confident that at least one of them deleted the randomness, this encrypted file that we just produced. That's the general idea. And uh, the reason that we also want to enter this extra identifying information is to do like a two-way binding between your address and your attestation. Uh, cool. So I see that uh, Judy already sent me um, her address. Judy, can you actually post it in the um, Crowdcast chat? Yes, thank you. So now I am, as the coordinator, going to be adding Judy to the ceremony. All right, that's it. So I added Judy. Now you can run your contribution software, and that's going to be the last step that you have to run. So you have to you have to point the contribution software to where your keys reside. So what we recommend uh, when running the setup and we're running the generate software is to generate your keys to to somewhere that you can maybe destroy later. That's the ideal situation. So if you generate it directly to a USB thumb drive, for example, later on, and then later on, you will be able to just destroy it. So when you run the contribution software, we tell it where the keys exist. 
maybe they exist on the USB thumb drive. So that's what you see here. I don't have a USB thumb drive. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> so in the first time, you also had some extra randomness. This is, again, something that you don't have to remember. You can just mesh your keyboard again. If we just like have a combination of two sources of randomness, both from the offline phase, where we generated the address, and this online phase, where we are now contributing. All right, so what happens now is that it's going to run. We have, you see, like the progress bar. There are 256 chunks to work on, and you're working on chunk 227 right now. And this is going to continue for something between 12 and 36 hours from what we've seen. So I'm going to kill it for now. Uh, yes, you should kill it very soon because it's going to take over your computer's uh, <laughs> computation. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much how to contribute. So I hope you've seen it's not very hard. And uh, anyone that wants to contribute, please, uh, we would be very happy for to have you. You so, share your screen again? Yeah, let me share it again. OK. So this week is the uh, last week for Cello Tech Talks as well. And we have two Cello Tech Talks scheduled for this week, um, the last week of uh, Cello Tech Talks. And today you joined the Plumo session. And on Thursday, we have um, James Presswich. He is from Suma One, and he's going to talk about cross-chain interoperability. Um, there are many new chains uh, um, being built and they're running now, and with the sharding and some of the other like scaling um, features. And so it's important to have a cross-chain uh, consensus uh, system. Um, so he's going to talk about cross-chain communication. So join us uh, this Thursday. And back to you, Kobe, for Q&A. So if you have any questions for Kobe, um, please post your question on the uh, bottom of your screen. There is an Ask a Question tab. And click on that, and um, you'll be able to uh, post your question. No question? Super clear, the demo, yeah? <laughs> nice. Any questions on Cello Tech Talk as well? Nothing. Very quiet crew. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone for joining the session. Oh, there is a question. Oh. And Neil, how far are we running a Plumo client on a mobile device? Um, okay, just to clarify, uh, do you mean do you mean how far are we from actually using Plumo to sync to the chain? That's the question, right? Um, okay. The like client protocol is already running on the mobile device. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Thanks for the comment. So uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, basically, we have uh, most of it implemented already. And what we're waiting for are two things. Um, the major thing is the setup. So we're going to run the two phases of the setup. So there is a phase which is circuit independent, um, which is what we're going to run, which is phase one. So we're going to start running it, like I said, this week. And afterwards, there's going to be phase two, which is the setup for the global circuit itself. So it's going to take a few months in total to run the setup. And in the meantime, we are completing the audits for the Plumo circuit. So basically, we have all the code written. And um, 
tested and so on. But we are going through uh, audits right now to make sure that malicious provers or malicious nodes cannot fool any light points. So more or less the idea is a few months, but they can give you like a super exact number. Oh, okay, that's a good question. So um, the question is, is this mobile client the go best implementation? And the, it's, it is a hybrid. So we, we are still running in cell blockchain, which is a Go-based client. Um, but most of the cryptography that we use for Plomo is implemented in Rust. And we're using the wonderful Arcworks ecosystem that is implemented for ZKSnarks. And uh, we just bundle the Rust libraries that we have inside the Go client. That's what happens. Cool. cool. No new questions from the audience. All right, I see you uh, all back in on to uh, Thursday. Yeah. Cool. We have a session on 6 p.m. Um, Eastern Europe time and PDT time will be 9 a.m. So I guess get up early <laughs> if you join me from US. <laughs> all right, thanks all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.